Good morning. My name is Sean Ware. When uh, Rebecca first said she was going to bring me up to view my uh, dream catcher that I had for her museum there, I was like, okay, cool. I'll go out there and see it. And then there was, oh yes, you're going to give a speech too. <laughs> so I didn't know what to write about. So I went into, or talked about, so I went into finding one of my poems. And this poem I wrote came from a lot of different tribes that have end of the world stories. It's not the end of the world, but it's the end of this time and a beginning for a new time. You know, we're in a lot of circles. And I'm going to read this poem, and then I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about it, and then I'm going to go on into some other stuff. So if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and read it. As false face plays a twisted melody, spider silently continues spinning her never-ending web. The smooth, beautiful cedaring tunes press gently across Mother Earth. Elk people dancing, buffalo wallowing, comforting weavers' busy routine, peacefully he knows, slowly, very slowly. Old lady, black dog too, down in the earth so deep, hears the life-giving music as she offers white buffalo woman a taste of her sweet berry soup. Arrow boy, eye on the mountain, listens as it flows through his people, bringing upon its song a melody of harmony. So relaxing, coyote was put fast asleep. So beautiful the gift, all the wind floated upon its stream of comfort. Sisters of the Great Dipper, brother stars too cherished the gift. Carried upon raven's wings, sharing the tune with all the heavens. Northern light reflects her sacred dance, sacred colors, along the peaceful path home. Dance with the winged, the four-legged, all water creatures too. The sky above, the ground below, in between, in every direction. Warriors of the rainbow, listen to the music of the cedar flute, which is played for only one reason, love, love of life. Now I'll kind of break that down a little bit so you understand where it's coming from, you know. The, the cedar, the flute is made out of cedar, which is very sacred to begin with, the cedar. And the, uh, I went and talking about Beaver. Beaver is a story that was told that whenever he finishes this great big tree, I mean, if some of you have been to the redwoods and seen how big they are, they say that when Beaver finishes gnawing that tree down, that's when the end's going to begin, I guess. The uh, old lady that's down in the cave, she's sitting there working on quill work. And when she gets up to stir her soup, the dog runs over there and undoes her quill work. But the story goes, if she ever finishes her quill work, that will be the end. Arrow Boy, he's always looking after his people. He's always busy, busy, busy. And if you notice in the poem, the cedar flute is slowing everybody down, everything down. Everything is getting relaxed, slow down. Our prophets, our spiritual people have also given us a chance to slow down. They give us the signs that they spoke of hundreds of years ago of what would take place when the end is getting near, the time for the change. And some of those things are, they would talk about the trees that are gonna die from the mountain, you know, from the tops down. And where I live on the Wind River Reservation, Right now, over 50% of the force has died because of beetles. And what it's going to take is, I spoke with uh, some of the forestry people, and they said it's going to take over 10 days of 30 below weather to stop that. Also, there on the Wind River Reservation at the headwaters of many of the rivers, to the Mississippi, to the Colorado, we're at the Continental Divide up there. You know, when my wife and I would go out on horseback, we could drink out of the streams, you know. Many of the streams drink straight out of them. Nowadays, you gotta take purification things and drink 
there's still some up there that you can drink directly out of, which is a good thing. But our uh, spiritual leaders have also told us that when this change is going to be taking place, some of the animals are going to start disappearing. Some of the animals are going to get sick like we are, you know. But the uh, sicknesses that are in the fish right now, you know, there's the lean. And that's a native species there. And it's becoming sick. The uh, trout has a swirling disease, not only there, but all through the country. And now these animals are getting sick like we are. And the natives, you know, we're supposed to be the caretakers of the world. Not only here, but everywhere. A little bit back to this poem here. You know, they say when the end gets near, there's going to be warriors from the rainbow. So if they listen to that music, they say that they're going to come down and they're going to take all the bad people and boom, do away with them. And all the good people are going to be taken care of and they're going to be the ones to advance on into this new world, this new beginning. So the cedar fruit put in there because I thought that if they would listen to the music and remember the music is for love from the cedar fruit and if they would just remember the cedar fruits being played for the love of life and I know that everyone in this world loves their life you know and so I said don't just take the good and do good and let them go on but you know, maybe we can help change the bad. And that's why I included the Rainbow Warriors. The Rainbow Warriors are to be, not warriors as we know them, with spears and everything, they're gonna be our children. They're gonna be children. They're gonna be the ones to take care of this earth. Also, you know, there's a sage grouse bird. It's endangered right now. West Nile, mosquitoes. A lot of these things were foretold a long time ago, you know, and some of our prophets are very powerful, very spiritual, and they share their knowledge with us. Years ago, in uh, 1920, there was a group of Native Americans, some uh, Iroquois, some Hopi, others from around the country. They went to New York City, which was, they formed uh, League of Nations, I think in 1919, but they went to the League of Nations in 1920. They spoke, they tried to speak to them, but they weren't allowed in. They went to speak to them about a thing they called the Gourd of Ashes. The Gourd of Ashes wasn't known about until 1945 when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They wanted to inform the League of Nations about the damage that it would cause. They wanted to inform them about the radiation, the sicknesses, and all the souls that would be lost because of that. Now, that was supposed to be top secret. No one was supposed to know about it. But our prophets and our elders and our spiritual people from across the country got together and went to speak to them. They wouldn't let them speak. Also, I'd like to speak on uh, coincidence, I guess. You know, I was really glad that Rebecca asked me to speak because I never spoke like this in front of anyone. I usually sit in a small circle. And now, because our elders and our spiritual people long ago said that 
in order to make a change, we're going to have to bring all the different colors of the world together in one place. We're going to have to bring these people because in the beginning, a long time ago, the people in America were given some knowledge, some native people, and their knowledge was to take care of the earth. The yellow people, they were given the knowledge on how to breathe and to bring in fresh air into your body to feed your soul with all that around you. The black people in Africa, they were given the knowledge of water because water is the most humble. Water doesn't care about how you use it, what you use it, but it is the most humble. The white man was given the knowledge of fire. If it wasn't for fire, none of us would be here because you find fire in the automobile and the trains and the planes. They have taken this knowledge of the fire and really, really used it in a way that if it's not for that, these circles that we're going to have to have in the future, we wouldn't be able to get together. We'd all have to walk or vote. So that was a gift he gave the white man. Some other things I like to talk about is the Tibetans. The Tibetans are on the other side of the world. The Hopis have many strong, many powerful prophets. The Hopi reservation is here. Straight across is where the Tibetans live. The word for sun in Hopi is the word for moon in Tibetan. The word for moon in Hopi is a word for sun in Tibetan. It's, their words are complete opposite, just like they are on the world. And they're really strong people there. And they have knowledge that is, we was told that they keep on their mountains. All these people, there are certain uh, race like the Hopi and the Tibetans, the, the Wheat Jaws, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the tribe in Africa, but they were all given knowledge, different knowledge, and they are all stored on mountains where they live. This knowledge is stored, carved in stones, and our prophets say that one day we'll be in a circle and we're going to have to share that knowledge with one another. I spoke of that earlier. We're going to have to share this knowledge with one another. You know, a similar prophecy that was with the Native Americans and with the Hopis was, you know, they speak of the road that's going to be built. You know, that was prophesied a long time ago. And there was going to be a buck on this road. That bug was going to raise dust. And that bug is going to learn to fly. And he became an eagle. And then he's going to learn to fly at night. And our Native American prophet said, when this eagle lands on the moon, that's going to be a time for the Native Americans to become free and a lot of the indigenous people to become free. And then the thing that really got me thinking is all these things people have told me over time it was like the coins in the beginning in the coins silver dollar I believe had a ending on it and on the back of the silver dollar they had the olive, olive branch and they had the arrows well they said the olive branch represents peace or what does the olive branch represent Peace and the arrows represented 13 states or colonies or whatever. Well, in the indigenous world, the arrows represent Native Americans. The United States got them. The olive branch and to the Native Americans represent the black people. They got them. Well, when the men first landed on the moon, the first thing they said was the eagle has landed. And all across 
the indigenous peoples, they knew that was the beginning for a change. Seven days after the man landed on the moon, the uh, Native Americans, they were really happy because before Congress, they went to pass the Freedom of Religion Act, which didn't get passed until 1978 by Jimmy Carter, but it was the beginning. And so to commemorate that landing of the moon, the United States decided to make another coin. At first they were gonna put the spaceship on the back, but then they went ahead and put the eagle on the back. And on that coin, all they had was the olive branch. They don't have the Indians in the other hand anymore. Now, I went back and I was looking at uh, the uh, Independence Day coin that they made. And that doesn't have uh, the olive branch on it. It has the bell, the Liberty Bell. And I couldn't help but think about, you know, uh, the saying, I believe it was Martin Luther King that said, let freedom reign. And I couldn't think, you know, I was like, wow, that's something else. You know, I see the bell and I'm thinking of ringing and I'm like, let freedom ring. And with that coin, he's not holding either natives or the blacks. You know, and our uh, elders tell us that there's going to be a, a lot of change. And they also tell us that this change is going to be happening, and they don't know when it's going to happen. They know that they have given us warning signs. And when I found out there was going to be people from all over the world, I figured, well, I'll, i got to go there because who knows if this is the circle. But in the Native world, we've also been told there's going to be several circles come together of all people from all over the world. And I see people from all over the world here. And those people are the ones that are going to educate the others outside. So next time, maybe our circle will be bigger, stronger, and we're going to get this knowledge to slow down this process of the end that's coming for the change. It's not going to be the end. It's going to be the beginning of something better. So I pray that these circles will grow more and more, and I'd really like to thank Rebecca for bringing us here today. Thank you. Is Peter Kelly in the house? Yes. Oh, Peter, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I am one of about 2,500 people around the world that has been trained to give you the slides that I'm going to show you now. They are part of a presentation that was delivered uh, in each time zone around the world, 24 times around the world uh, last October. And it's an update of slides that Al Gore has been showing to audiences since, since the 1980s. He first showed them on actual slides, including to his fellow U.S. Senators, to uh, encourage them to take action on global warming. We've learned a great deal since then. So somewhere, there's a world where the temperature's not getting warm. Where bigger floods are not wreaking havoc around the world. Deeper and longer droughts are not killing our crops, animals, and people. Our 
where fires are not spreading wildly and burning hotter and longer than they have in the past. Where the winds and the storms are not getting more destructive. These pictures are recent. This was taken in Montana last year as a storm front came in. But not here. Because here, on planet Earth, which is where all of human history has occurred and where we will spend all of the rest of our days as a species, the reality is that the world is getting warmer and it's getting warmer more rapidly than we were told even a few years ago. The graph that you've seen and that you can watch in greater detail in the movie An Inconvenient Truth shows the close connection between the increasing amount of carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere and the temperature on the planet. And um, sometimes I encourage people to think about how much carbon each one of us puts in the atmosphere each day. And I invite people to think, how much is that? How, how much do you think each American, on average, each day of our lives puts in the atmosphere? And the answer is about 22 pounds of carbon. Now to visualize that, think of going down to the hardware store and getting one of the big bags of charcoal. Not the little ones, but the big 10 pound bags. Get two of those. Take them home, open them up, throw them all over your neighbor's lawn, and then go about your business. Then do it again the next day. And do it every day of your life. And everyone you see is also doing it every day of their lives. That's how much carbon we put in the, in the atmosphere as human beings who live in America. It's actually difficult for us to get down below about 10 pounds because of how much embedded energy there is in everything we do. The cars we drive, the, the clothing we wear, the furniture we buy is not made of just wood, it's made of coal because half of our electricity comes from coal. And the, that electricity is used to fabricate that furniture, move it to you, store it, house it in stores, and then we take it home in, in gasoline-powered cars for the most part. So, as you think about that, consider what the impact of that is in our lifetime. This is not a far distant future scenario. This is not even at the end of our lifetime. These pictures that I'm showing you all happened in the last 18 months. So what's predicted is that as the temperature increases, we get more moisture, for instance, in the atmosphere. And it changes the patterns by which that moisture moves through our universe so that we'll see some places that are a lot wetter than usual. Now just north of that drought belt is where we get a lot of our food. It's called the bread basket or the wheat belt. Under a double carbon dioxide world, that area is going to lose over half of its soil moisture. And we'll get to that double carbon dioxide world sometime in around the middle of this century. So during our lifetimes and during our children's lifetimes, our, our bread belt will lose half of its soil moisture. Now that's a fact that might be expected to impact the price of our food. So the reality is we've got to get busy. Now the good news is I tell people, I personally have a great sense of alarm about this, but it also, for the most part, hasn't happened yet. It's happening now. It's starting to happen. It's in ways that we can measure and show on a picture. But we have a huge opportunity here as, as people alive both to enjoy the world as it is and to use all its resources to try to save as much as we can. And this is a, a fact known at the top levels of government worldwide. And not just here in the United States, this quote is from the head of Russia. Now, I want to talk about those who deny this, because those of you who go out into your daily lives, as I did today at the bike shop, and I told the woman next to me, where am I going? She said, oh, I've heard that's been exaggerated. Are there are people who say that's all a hoax. 
So for starters, I want to assure you that there actually is scientific consensus that over 97% of all scientific papers written on this subject agree that it's human caused global warming we're facing. And that there is no major scientific body in the world that has rejected this science. However, you wouldn't know that from what some of the people around the world are saying when they have a conflict of interest. So this is what the scientists say. I've seen scientists reveal that, uh, that this could be 50,000 times what man's involvement in terms of creating CO2 would be. Uh, you begin to scratch your head and wonder, wait, what is it? Is it sunspots? This is what is known as a red herring. <laughs> volcanoes here, could be volcanoes. A thousand times as much of contribution to global warming as, as we do. Really? says it's a thousand times, you know it's actually a tiny fraction of one percent. So there is a conflict of interest here. People are paid to say these things and they have a lot of lobbyists working for them. Let's see what else we can blame on. It's called sunspots. Yes solar activity. That explains why one sees similar temperature cycles on Mars and Jupiter to the cycles that are happening on this planet. That's why ice caps on those planets, like on ours, expand and contract. It's the sun, stupid. So there's a wonderful uh, website and app, Climate Skeptic, it's called, and it contains dozens of these, and they're actually ranked when you pull them up on your phone as to which ones have been hit most often on the internet recently. And so you'll see the most popular ones at the moment coming up first, and then you can read through all the scientific evidence. And the, the app and the website has links to all these scientific studies, so you can actually go directly to the science. So I think um, we've got a little bit of a keynote versus PowerPoint contest, and keynote is winning right now. But there are a lot of these myths, and they've been examined extensively. And so ultimately, you get ridiculed if you care about this issue. This show has won so many science awards. Sometimes we get talking about highfalutin science, things like this, and people are like, what are you talking about? So let me just break it down. Carbon, carbon dioxide is basically this. Look how much pollution I just put out. <laughs> George, the idea of the carbon dioxide uh, is, is a carcinogen that is harmful to our environment. It, it's almost comical. So do you remember when uh, we were told that cigarette smoking wasn't so harmful for you and a whole breed of scientists came forward known as tobacco scientists and they testified and they did studies and there were even ads about how doctors preferred camels. 
So just because you hear an expert testifying about how there may not be a problem here, does not mean that those of us who understand the science shouldn't spend the rest of our lives, as I intend to, working on this issue. Because we, during our lives, will see this happening. We're seeing it right now. This is not a future problem that we can pretend some future generation will take care of. And it's not just happening in New Delhi, India. It's happening in our big cities. This was last summer in New York during a stretch of 100 plus degree days. So we know we have to change. Is it possible? So that's a whole other category of skepticism. OK, I get the science, but there's nothing we can do. It's too late. Or there's nothing I can do. Really? This young man was able to make a windmill and generate electricity for his village using those parts. And he is now one of the best-selling African authors ever. In fact, you can buy his book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Sun, or The Wind, I'm sorry. We're going to get to the sun in a moment. And it's not just in this country, but around the world, people are adopting these solutions. And so you can work here, you can work there. Your solar-powered laptops being used in Africa and Sierra Leone. And this is solar energy on a different scale. This is a former client of mine when I worked uh, in environmental PR. Abigail Solar is making these power towers and shining the sun's rays on a single point that gets over a thousand degrees. And then you use that heat to generate electricity rather than burning coal to make the heat to generate the electricity. So too late, they're already winning, they've got more money than we do. Actually, most of the coal plants in this country are being canceled because of citizen-led campaigns by people in this room, I imagine, I'm sure. Is there anybody here who's done anything to lessen the impact of coal on the environment? And you could, excellent, the next speaker, I'm told. You can get active, you can contribute, you can donate your time, and you can make a difference. And ultimately, we will have better technology. We'll have much less energy using technology. So people who say, oh, well, wind can only generate 20% of the country's electricity, and solar is never going to get more than 20%, and you know, nuclear already makes 20%. Well, what's that about? Well, actually, these technologies make it at half the cost of nuclear, and they can get far bigger than that, especially if we cut back on our energy use. And then there are all the other things you can do to alter the way we use the land, to alter the amounts of methane we're releasing through procedures like fracking, to change the balance in favor of trees that absorb the carbon dioxide and sequester the carbon in the soil. So in the uh, conversation that Al Gore leads, when he gives this and the rest of us lead, we do finish with familiar solutions. But I would say that individual action is not enough. We need to change the rules by which our society operates because it's actually not possible to reduce our carbon footprints individually fast enough by as much as we need to. We need to change the rules. So engaging with power is ultimately where the action is going to be. Although it's still a good idea to turn off the lights and make sure they're, carbon they're compact fluorescents, we need to engage. So this is one way to do it, and um, there are many ways, uh, starting with just considering the, the embodied energy in things we do and buy, because that's a huge amount of the contribution. Our houses actually contribute more to global warming than our cars do. So,
necessarily the most comfortable. Antrim Caskey did not come along, uh, come in here. And Antrim, are you here, please? Can you turn the light up? Yes. Antrim uh, is a young person who, in our good friend from New York, Reverend Billy in the Church of, of Stop Shopping, he made Antrim a saint. And I think that's for very good use. Peter, your segue to Antrim is perfect because you're asking what people are doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the coal industry. Antrim Caskey, thanks. That's what I'm here to talk about, and uh, what an array of speakers and information. Um, I'm an independent photojournalist. Um, yeah, you can go ahead. And let's just hold on the first, or not that slide, but just as the however you planned. Um, maybe lights down if we could, so we can see the images. Um, in the back, you'll see a copy of this, Dragline. Uh, this is a magazine book I produced. Um, it's based on about five years of work on the human and environmental costs of mountaintop removal coal mining. What is mountaintop removal coal mining? Here is one of its victims, a good friend of mine at Wiley. <laughs> mountaintop removal coal mining is modern day coal mining done basically by machine. And this is what the land looks like. Oh, God. <laughs> um, It's just so much of what we've been talking about, the, the human costs. And uh, right now, the energy coming to this city. restrict what comes out of the stacks of the coal-fired power plants. All that deadly material now has been transferred to the waste byproduct of washing the coal before they send it to the market. And that's called sludge. And that's what's on the cover of drag line. So um, when they <coughs> finish washing the coal, um, they have this sludge left over, and it's laden with everything that's in the coal. And they, <laughs> they pump it underground. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so upset, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm just a photographer <laughs> who really just <clears throat> fell in love <laughs> with the people. That and the place. And if you think about it, it's coal industries and has one of the most entrenched lobbies. And it's really the height of what you would call social injustice. And one of the subjects that, <clears throat> in fact, inspired photojournalism. Um, Lewis Hine photographed the Breaker Boys who uh, the images he made and documented um, enlightened people about child labor and what children were doing with coal and helped get the first child labor laws. In uh, 1977, Jimmy Carter signed the Service Mine Reclamation and Control Act, which is the first federal legislation to govern surface mining. And this act essentially institutionalized the process known as mountaintop removal coal mining, where first they clear cut, and then they take all the uh, earth and rock, what they call overburden, and they push that into the valley. And then they blast the bedrock of the mountain. And 
and when you blow it up, it, it, the volume expands like by three times, and all that material fills up the valley below, which are the headwater streams for the southeast United States at least. They take the peaks down about 900 feet, and over the past 20 years, about a million square miles have been turned into moonscape. <clears throat> this is the most diverse, temperate hardwood forest in the, in, the, in the hemisphere, second only to the Amazon in Brazil. There are 150 different species of hardwood trees. Think of all the animals in the habitat. <clears throat> Um, in fact, in the last, during the last ice age, um, the valleys of Appalachia were so narrow and steep that they weren't iced, so that Appalachia is the seed bed of North America. But we're ripping it apart. She died, right? And she was an amazing leader. This is Judy Bonds. That's right. She was my best friend. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Incredible. Yes. This is Cold River Mountain Watch. This is the lone outpost in a town called Whitesville. Killed, boom and bust. It's just for naught now. And you have people like Kathy with her water, like this. This is Cook Mountain. This is a horrible story. This is their family cemetery. And they have three along this ridge. You know, the, the ridges in Appalachia, they stretch like arms. And they've done all of this around the three family cemeteries within a 100-foot buffer. That's the law. You can surface mine within a 100 feet of a Civil War era cemetery because the coal is cheap and everybody likes it. That's his grave. He fought in the Civil War. So the people and their place, it's of lesser value than the coal underneath of it. And we've seen that in the Four Corners region with the Navajo and uranium mining. It's a sacrifice zone. But despite all my emotion and sadness, again, I'm sorry about that. Um, I do have hope, and in fact, I think the change is in the making. Um, like we just saw in the previous slideshow, if we could just pause at that and then maybe that would be a good place, that's the last slide. Um, I just want to say a couple things about the activists down there. I think the change has begun because the awareness of mountaintop removal, five, six years ago when I first started working on it, and I would talk to my family and friends about it, they wouldn't really know what it was. And, and I've seen how their awareness and understanding has grown so much, and that's great. Um, I think it's inevitable we're going to have to correct things and change. It's within us all. It is. It's within us all. Awareness into action. Thank you so much. Uh, there is probably no more respected environmental activist in Maryland, so it brings it home in the state of the world that we're looking at today, 2012, to bring it home to Maryland, than Michael Tidwell. Is Mike here? Thank you so much. I have just heard the most wonderful things about you. Well, I'm director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network, and um, Antrim Kasky, that's a tough act to follow, but I'm really honored to come after you. Um, you know, we used to take the coal out of the mountains, and now we just take the mountains off the coal. You know, before we even burn it, just appalling impacts on human and natural communities. You know, I mean, the children in, in Appalachia who sleep with their clothes on on rainy nights, and their parents leave the keys in the car, because of the flooding, the sudden flooding that comes from denuding these mountains from mountaintop removal. And I mean, just imagine having your children sleep with their clothes on, clothes on at night so that you can make a quick getaway when you hear that water thundering down unnaturally flooding these communities. It's just morally completely unacceptable. 
time. That was a really amazing testimony. Um, I just want to say, and I want to talk a little bit about what we can do about these problems and, and how we how we take action on these problems. Um, you know, I am still warming up today because yesterday morning I was on the banks of the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. at National Harbor. And we all know we woke up yesterday morning, uh, I think there was first a layer of snow, and then there was a layer of sleet, and then we had a little frozen rain on top, um, and it's still out there. But yesterday morning I was with uh, a couple of hundred other really, really crazy people, and somehow we all made our way to National Harbor on a beach on the Potomac River, uh, and somehow we all went swimming. We all jumped in the river. Now I'm going to tell you how I was able to do that in a moment, but first I want to tell you that um, my wife and any of my closest friends tell me I'm in the wrong business because you know my job, my central passion, what I think about every morning when I get up in the morning is how can we stop global warming? You know, you heard Peter Kelly and those amazing slides of all the impacts all over the world. I wake up every morning. I've given my life to this. Made a mid-career change from a freelance journalist to a full-time climate activist. How can we solve global warming? Uh, and my friends joke because people who know me know that I hate winter. I hate cold weather, you know? Uh, and yesterday morning, a little, a little global warming would have been nice. Um, I mean, an outdoor pool in August feels freezing to me. Uh, and yet, yesterday morning, I jumped into the icy Potomac River near downtown Washington, D.C. Um, and I, I just want to tell you in a moment how I'm able to do that. That was my seventh year in a row to jump in the Potomac River as part of an annual uh, uh, event that we call Keep Winter Cold, Save the Polar Bears. But before I tell you how I am personally able to overcome my horror of cold water and jump into the Potomac in January, I just want to talk about climate change uh, uh, for a, a couple more minutes here. Um, in December, uh, scientists with the International Energy Agency uh, meeting in Durban, South Africa uh, in, in December, just a month ago, uh, announced that uh, because of all the CO2 that we're putting in the atmosphere from the combustion of coal, oil, and natural gas, the amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere, the amount of warming, the pattern, the trend of the warming now and, and, and what we're going to put into the atmosphere if we don't change, according to the International Energy Agency, highly respected international body, they said last month that we are perfectly, this, that was their word, we are perfectly on path to create 11 degrees Fahrenheit warming by the year 2100. 11 degrees, we are per perfectly on track to achieve that level of warming. Now, to understand how much 11 degrees Fahrenheit is for this planet, let's first review what's happening to our planet already. All those things, you, all those slides you saw Peter Kelly show, all the droughts, all the floods, how much warming has happened to cause that? Let me also tell you, Blackwater Wildlife Refuge on the Eastern Shore, Dorchester County, I don't know if any of you have been there, amazing, like 50,000 acres of wetlands. Migratory birds winter there. It's just an amazing wonderland of wetlands in uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Every day in Blackwater Wildlife Refuge alone, every day, an acre of land turns to water, day after day, from sea level rise triggered mostly by global warming. Virginia Beach, Virginia. The city council members, the, the civic planners there are planning right now a full-on retreat of much of that city as we speak. They are holding hearings to retreat because of sea level rise. Um, Allstate Insurance Company, if you live in the 11 easternmost counties of Maryland, which includes part of Baltimore, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, the whole eastern shore, the 11 easternmost counties of Maryland, if you want to buy a new homeowner's insurance for your house, you might buy it from somebody, but it won't be from Allstate Insurance. In 2006, Allstate said because of sea level rise related to global warming and because storms are getting bigger in the Atlantic, that Allstate Insurance Company will not give you a new homeowner's policy in the 11 easternmost counties of Maryland. This is right now. This is happening right now. The strange weather. I mean, it's not just Maryland. It's all over the world. It's too hot, too dry, too wet, too cold. There's no normal. I mean, this winter alone is on track to set a record for the warmest winter ever in the mid-Atlantic. You know, we had an, we've had brutal summers the last two years. We've had record snow, extreme precipitation, uh, the flooding, the rain. 
Lee, Tropical Storm Lee. I mean, I'm talking Marylanders who lived here all their life for 60, 70 years, never saw rain like, like uh, Tropical Storm Lee brought this last fall. Extreme weather, and then of course the droughts, the floods, etc., that we saw on those flights. Now, all of that, all of that that's already happening, that we know is happening, that's measurable, that we can see with our own eyes, that we're experiencing in our own lives, and Blackwater Wildlife Refuge losing an acre a day. How much warming has happened? Well, the answer is 1.4 degrees, most of it since 1900. 1.4 degrees warming Fahrenheit on this planet gives you all what we're seeing. Now, what would 11 degrees do by 2100? I mean, this really is totally and completely unthinkable. We cannot go there, obviously, but we need to change very, very quickly. We need to stop burning oil. We need to stop burning coal. We need to transition as fast as we can, even off of natural gas. I mean, mountaintop removal, I mean, if that doesn't motivate us to seek another way to generate electricity, I don't know what, what can. Uh, nearly 60% of our electricity in Maryland comes from coal. Most people don't know that. Yes, most people, where's your electricity come from? The electricity for this microphone, for these lights. Where, where does it come from in Maryland? A lot of people would say, uh, I don't know, a nuclear, a hydro. Uh, the reality is nearly 60% in this state is from the combustion of coal. We have to transition off. So what are the solutions? So let's talk about solutions for a minute. One of the biggest solutions in our state of Maryland is wind power. And it's actually offshore wind power. Now Arizona, they got lots of sun. Really big solar projects make sense. Like that, that, that power tower that Peter showed a picture of earlier. Arizona has tons of sun. Solar technology makes sense for them. We're not Arizona. We're not blasted with sunshine 360 days a year. So solar is what's best for Arizona. Places like Iceland, they have tons of geothermal. They have this you know, volcanic lava right under the soil that they can tap to heat their homes. You know, all different regions of the world have different you know, signature alternative energy potentials. So what does Maryland have? Well, it turns out that the coast of Maryland is one of the windiest shorelines in the world. It is an incredibly untapped potential for wind power. And not only that, it's shallow. It's between, you know, you could go out 100 miles and it's still only between 100 and 150 feet deep. It's shallow, it's windy, and it's also beautifully close to where people use electricity. You know, in terms of wind power, we don't have a lot of open space in, space in Maryland. And it turns out that a lot of people, they don't want to live too close to the wind turbines. You know, there's some issues with visual impacts. And, and it hasn't been easy to build onshore wind power in Maryland. Um, but offshore wind power, putting them 10 miles or more off the coast, perfect energy solution for this state. It is our signature energy resource, which is why Governor Martin O'Malley last year introduced a bill that would incentivize about 100 offshore wind turbines about 500 megawatts of offshore wind. And that bill alone, the one wind farm of about 100 turbines, 500 megawatts, it's staggering. You're just not going to believe the benefits from one wind farm. This one wind farm that the governor would incentivize would create about 2,400 new jobs in Maryland. It would uh, avoid about a million tons of CO2 per year, one wind farm, an enormous amount of CO2. Um, and here's one thing that's really staggering. Four billion dollars in avoided health costs from one wind farm over 25 years. 700 premature deaths avoided. Why? Because it's that much less coal that you burn. Coal kills people. Coal in the air kills people from asthma, from particulate matter. One wind farm saves 700 lives and saves us four billion dollars in health costs over 25 years. And of course it helps us to begin ending global warming. That bill last year in the General Assembly did not come up for a vote. Uh, it did not make it out of the committees. The governor tomorrow is going to reintroduce that bill. The Maryland Offshore Wind Bill. So this is how I get back to the Potomac River and taking a swim yesterday. <laughs> that offshore wind bill is going to help us stop global warming. It's going to help us stop mountaintop removal. We can't just be educated about the problems and educated about the solutions. We have to work for the solutions. Now, me, by myself, you know, I cannot solve global warming. Andrew Caskey, by herself, she cannot stop mountaintop removal. All right? Me by myself standing on the Potomac River yesterday, if I was by myself and wasn't with 200 people, you could give me 
$10,000. You can have it stacked up on the side of the river and say, go into the water, we give you $10,000. I'm not going in the water if I'm by myself. You can hit me with a two by four for hours. We will stop hitting you with the two by four if you go in the water. If I'm by myself, keep hitting me with the two by four. But it's an amazing thing. Every year when we gather on the banks of the icy Potomac River in January, we always pick the coldest week of the year, the third week of January, to do this. We got 200 people on the banks. We all down in our swimsuits. We've gone into the changing tents. We've had all our speeches. We've had the music. It's time to go in the water. We got somebody with a bullhorn ready to count down 10, 9, 8, down to 0. You know, we're ready to go. And when we get down 3, 2, 1, 0, and we hit 0, it's amazing. I look to my right. I look to my left. I see people 8 years old and people 80 years old. And when we get to 0, nobody hesitates. And I don't hesitate. No pause. I go right into the river. That is the power of the group. The power of the group. Things we cannot do by ourselves. When we come together, we can solve all problems. We can come overcome all obstacles. We can stop mountaintop removal. We can end global warming, even with the limited amount of time that we have. And so that's just what I want to tell you. That's really on my mind. It was cold yesterday when I went in the water. But I was able to do it because I was with others who care as much as, as we do in this room. So, which is why this conference is such a great thing to bring us together. Great speakers, great ideas. And I just want to say, when you come to a conference like this, if you leave afterwards a little better educated, that's great. You learn a little bit more about the challenges, the environmental challenges, that's great. If you leave a little bit inspired, you know, you were like uplifted by the tears and the laughter and all the great emotions that you experience, you were inspired. That's great, but if that's all that happens is that you're a little bit educated, a little bit more inspired, then those of us who come to this podium today, we fail. Because everybody who's come here today, we're here not just to educate you and inspire you, but to move you to action. To move you to action, to do something, to take a step. Which is why I brought some postcards. <laughs> I want to distribute these and I just ask you to help us pass the offshore wind bill that's going to be introduced tomorrow by Governor O'Malley. I would just ask you to take one minute and fill out one of these postcards. I'm going to distribute them this way. They're going to come down the rows and before, if you can just fill it out real quick. It's already printed out. It says, Dear General Assembly, Pete, please pass this bill. Just print your name clearly, your email address clearly. It will give you a chance to take action. I promise we won't spam you. Your legislator, we're going to figure out which legislator to give to based on your address if you're from Maryland. Um, and they're going to contact you. So please um, print your email address clearly. I'm an organizer. I'm an activist. I don't speak anywhere without giving people a chance to take action. So I'm going to distribute these postcards. And I want to thank uh, Abby and Rebecca again for having me. Thank you very much. I think all of you, all of our sponsors, all of our presenters, all of our first peoples who came from so far, and especially the best staff in America, thank you so, so much. <laughs>